Good morning, um, good afternoon, good evening to, to everyone. Um, apologies, I'm accidentally advancing the slides instead of just unmuting myself. <laughs> so Richard, if you could help me just skip back to my, my first slide, that'd be great. Um, my name's Andre Chow. Um, I'm the Vice President and General Manager of the Digital Surgery business here at Medtronic. Um, here at Digital Surgery, we really focus on using digital technologies, um, data, AI, um, to really expand access to high quality surgical care. And it gives me a really great pleasure today to introduce you to the first of three webinars, uh, which we'll be doing over the next few months. Um, and today we're gonna be focusing on the issue of surgical video and really how to use it best um, to improve your surgical practice, help your surgical teams um, and so on. Um, you can see the um, agenda um, there, there in front of you. Uh, we'll be going over some, some high level concepts before kind of diving a little bit deeper into the evolution of recording surgical video and you know, some specific points around um, how video can be used um, to, Im to improve your practice. Um, as, as Richard mentioned, um, please submit any questions um, using the Q&A function, uh, which should be there in your Zoom window. Um, and we'll make sure to, to save some time at the end uh, to kind of go over those. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker today, uh, Dr. Sanjay Perky yasler uh, who I've known for many, many years. He is a consultant general surgeon uh, with a specialist interest in bariatric and upper gastrointestinal surgery. Um, and he works um, at Imperial College Surgery and Cancer Division, as well as the One Welbeck Digestive Surgery um, and King Edward VII Hospital in London. Uh, welcome, Sanjay. Real pleasure to have you here. Thank you, Andre. And uh, thank you to Medtronic for inviting me. And uh, thanks for everyone who has uh, joined us to... Uh, listen to our chat today. Great. All right, well, uh, let's, uh, let's jump straight into it. So I'm gonna try and advance these slides here. Great, so um, uh, let's, let's start off with a, with a pretty, pretty broad question here. Um, obviously, we're here today to talk about um, surgical, surgical video. And really, Sanjay, I'd, I'd really love to kind of, I guess, get your, your broad opinions, first of all, um, on you know, what are the sorts of ways in which we can use surgical video to, to help surgical practice um, and, and so on? So I think a lot of um, surgeons and practitioners have um, been interested in the video capture element of surgery for probably decades, but up until recently, it's been quite cumbersome. Uh, now, previously, I'm sure there are a lot of people listening in who have recorded their laparoscopic or arthroscopic or endoscopic procedures. Um, they've had to then either historically kind of burn them and then uh, put them onto a format where they could uh, edit them to use them for conferences, education, presentations, but also for training. Now, from a training perspective, uh, probably about a decade and a half ago, uh, when I was training, I started recording the laparoscopic procedures that I was carrying out, mainly to see uh, objectively after the cases were done, uh, what did it look like when I was operating retrospectively? Uh, and I tried to push some of these videos under the noses of my then trainers to say, hey, what do you think of how I'm doing? And at the time, uh, a lot of uh, surgeons were uh, not really keen to do so. And at the time, because of research and training, all of our patients were consented for image capture anyway. So um, one of the things I thought that could be helpful would be not just for my own training, but for a peer-to-peer -peer review or even sharing things with patients. Um, and that is an attitude that I think we really need to move towards. Uh, and that's kind of how the journey started really to try and improve my own performance and see what other people who don't see me working in the OR and who aren't my direct trainers thought of my surgical technique. So that's where it kind of started from. That's really interesting. And it's, it's, it's fascinating that you've been trying to kind of use, use this, this digital media for really for, for quite a while now. Um, you know, so obviously you've used it quite a lot in regards to self-improvement and your own training. Um, where do you kind of see this 
technology going in the future? Where, where are the avenues that this, this could help kind of be on train? So it really helps in pre preparedness. And that's probably a term we've heard much more during the pandemic. But it, it's, it will help us with rehearsal. Um, it certainly helps with onboarding. It helps with um, academic presentations and training presentations. Uh, it helps with explaining things to patients, not just preoperatively, but postoperatively. Uh, for example, you know, anti-reflux surgery can explain exactly why you did what you did, uh, the extent of hiatal dissection, you know, the fact that uh, you know, some patients' hiatus hernias are undercalled or overcalled from the diagnostics and why we picked a particular uh, approach during that surgery. And also uh, contentious issues, but if there are intraoperative complications, we found actually using video is a lot easier to explain these to patients and relatives as to why it was a challenging case, why something may have happened uh, perioperatively. And we found that it helps dialogue amongst other practitioners as well as patients. A lot of places have moved to electronic records. Um, a lot of us feel, particularly in our institutions, that the, the operative video is really crucial to our electronic records, uh, along with the operative note. And for certain surgeries where there is revisional surgery in the future, um, it is very valuable to know exactly what was done. But in those cases, sometimes you don't have to watch the whole video. And if you have access to the right segments of the video, then preparing for revisional surgery is very helpful. So all of these different tools um, have come about. And during our journey in the last eight to 10 years with uh, different ways of video capture, as we'll talk about in a, in a second, it's also opened our eyes to other potential patient safety positives, you know, uh, swab counts, uh, issues with kit during the procedure, uh, you know, ensuring that certain steps of surgery are followed. And it has certainly led to increased standardization in our unit across the board when it comes to deciding which kit we're going to use, which operative steps we're going to use. And it has also meant that, uh, particularly in our specialties, we've all sat down, uh, all surgeons together to kind of decide can we standardize our approach to different procedures as a unit and not just from a surgeon to surgeon perspective? So it's really aided collaboration as well. That's fantastic. So kind of you can see how you've started to think about using this all the way through from, from training um, through to actually standardization of practice um, and, and collaboration with colleagues as well. It's absolutely fascinating. Um, before, before we move on to the next section, um, I think we, we've got a little poll um, that we wanted to, um, to do just to, to get a, a bit of a benchmark as to how, how, our, how our audience feel about video currently. So hopefully a question will have popped up on your screen um, at the moment um, that's going to ask you how often do you record your surgical video uh, with a number of options there. So either for, you record for every elective and emergency case or just for elective cases or just sometimes really or never. Um, so if you could just take a second just to, to answer that and then the, the poll should disappear from your screen. Um, and we can get a quick snapshot really of, of what, our, what our audience thinks. And here we go. So um, it looks like the, the majority of, of you only sometimes um, record, uh, record your video. Um, and, and yeah, so that's a, that's a, a nice little snapshot really of, of, of where we are. Um, great. So let's move on to the, the next slide, please, Richard. Um, and really, Sanjay, what I wanted to, to dive into here was about, I guess, the, the experience that most surgeons have today uh, with trying to record surgical video, right? So you, you mentioned previously, you know, the need to potentially burn DVDs and, and so on and so forth. Um, I'm, I'm sure a lot of surgeons have experience now with, you know, integrated operating rooms and, you know, advanced laparoscopic towers and so on. But do, do those devices make accessing your surgical video easy today or are, are there still problems? I mean, things have moved on a lot in the last decade and a half. Um, initially, uh, I'm sure everyone will remember the days where we had to burn everything onto CD. That took a long time. 
that then had to be uploaded onto your hard drive and you know to edit a video you know even a, a straightforward laparoscopic cholecystectomy or laparoscopic hernia repair is you know a minimum of 30 to 45 minutes of footage you'd have to edit that down it all i mean the data transfer itself took a lot of time uh, the advent at the advent of uh, usbs made it easier you know encrypted hard drives are very useful but still even with usb 3s it does take a significant amount of time because it is so much data and with the advent of um, high definition and ultra high definition images the, the the amount of data on that bundle is even more and so at the end of each case you know previously you, you or the end of the day you're downloading this huge amount of data and then you have this issue of where do you put it where do you keep it where is it safe and so those issues with data safety and encryption were some of the things that we had to discuss you know at our internal review board equivalent and get through our nhs trusts and other hospital governance boards to make sure that they corresponded with in the uk all the gdpr data regular regulatory issues got them all ticked off but it just means that now that we have a way of uploading this video almost automatically at the end of each case and for standardized procedures where we have worked as part of our research collaboration and research projects of my PhD students to be able to segment these videos into the, the major steps that at the end of a procedure, you just hit one button and basically it's uploaded into a cloud and seven or eight minutes later, you have um, a video that you can annotate, edit the different steps on, know how long each step took, uh, and then actually put footnotes if there were problems and then mark it uh, to see if it's something you wanna discuss with your colleagues, it's useful for training, it's something you want the people who have access to your portfolio to look at. And all of these things just takes a matter of minutes at the end of each case. Uh, and then if something were to happen to that case, it's very easy to pick it up and then actually discuss it with the images uh, in your routine monthly, bi-monthly, or whatever you, you know, each unit does for their morbidity and mortality meeting. So it's really kind of made that whole pathway much less cumbersome. Uh, it also means that if there's a particular step that is, a, is the bit that, you know, you want to take to a conference or, uh, you know, use for training, you can just use that particular step. Uh, and it means you don't have to go through reams of video trying to find exactly the bit that you need. So loads of positives. Don't have a negative at that moment to share with you, I'm afraid. No worries. I mean, you, you brought us on nicely to, to the next next section, actually, which is around the, the solution that, that we've developed. Um, Richard, if you wouldn't mind advancing the slide just one. So really, um, the, the, the product there that, that Sanjay was talking about, which he's been using now for, for over a year, um, is our touch surgery enterprise system, uh, which essentially was developed to, to solve the issues of, of data management and, and surgical video management. Um, as Sanjay mentioned, you know, we've all come across colleagues who do take a lot of time burning DVDs or saving um, files to USB drives um, which are often unencrypted. Um, and really what we've developed is a very simple, almost plug and play system that plugs into any laparoscopic stack um, using our DS1 computer that you can see there on the right hand side of the screen, um, which then essentially connects your operating room with our secure cloud based video management system um, available on your um, computer um, or on your mobile device. Um, so essentially you have all of your videos there at your fingertips minutes after finishing your operation. Um, also should mention um, around data security, which is one of the one of the concerns um, that Sanjay brought up. Um, the whole system is compliant with a number of different regulations, including HIPAA, high tech, SOC 2, etc. So it's been designed really from the ground up with privacy in mind. Um, Sanjay, now, now that you've had the chance to, to kind of use this system now for for um, you know, well over a year, and I, I've seen you, you've you've actually uploaded hundreds of, of videos now up onto the system. Um, you know, what what change in practice has this made for your team, or what what has this allowed your team to do? You think that um, that can't be done in in other places? So it's been useful in areas where 
uh, we were expecting it to be useful, such as for you know uh, perioperative training, uh, presenting useful cases, M and M's, etc. But it has also highlighted the need for a, uh, a proper onboarding system with uh, surgical trainees. So, for example, I'll be getting a new trainee in April. Uh, they've already been sent uh, a link to be able to access my portfolio. That portfolio doesn't just have the cases that we've done, but the standardization of how uh, those cases are carried out, the positioning, the kit, um, little links to how to use the kit. So uh, in a lot of places, particularly in the UK, induction or onboarding revolves around coming to the hospital and understanding the geography of the hospital and what things you need in your training portfolio and a whole bunch of other things, including fire safety and, you know, lifting regulations. But... Um, until recently, you know, we weren't actually providing induction of what we do in the operating room so that they can prepare for it. So onboarding is one. Uh, the second thing is uh, uh, rehearsal and preparation. Uh, there's great evidence out there um, uh, uh, that cognitive task assessment and analysis, just like athletes thinking through what they will be doing on the big day of their big race, uh, is very relevant to surgical brains and surgical decision making. This alongside the touch surgery platform allows that both with video and animation now. It also allows our scrub techs to prepare if they're new. And I'm sure everyone's experienced during the pandemic that you work with very different teams and the continuity of teams has broken down. And so that allows others other than the trainees to actually prepare for the case and the kit. It also allows comparison, which uh, some people like, some people don't. But we can tell you from standardizing our procedures that actually five or six surgeons, uh, there is very little difference whether uh, uh, the uh, between the different consultants operating or when the registrars or trainees are operating. The system has allowed us to demonstrate that during the pandemic, even with lockdown, in the in the times that we were allowed to carry out benign bariatric surgery, you know, out of the 180 cases that we carried out between July and end of November last year, 70% were carried out by trainees. Um, so it's a whole host of uh, benefits that some of which we were, we were hoping for and some of which that we have stumbled across. But most importantly, it's been very simple to record cases. Uh, you just need to plug the stack in and, and hit record. And then at the end, you just need to hit stop. And it can't get any easier than that really, even for someone who uh, you know, I'm I'm not a social media kind of guy, but using this uh, technology is uh, has been very, very straightforward for me and the whole team. And it's also led to behavioral change across the unit with my surgical colleagues who uh, all of who in the unit have now agreed, not just in bariatrics, but uh, across specialties. Anyone that carries out laparoscopy in our trust across three sites has now, uh, you know, agreed to using this and recording every case when and where possible, including emergencies. That's fantastic. Um, let's let's jump onto the the next slide, Richard, um, and let's dive a little bit deeper into surgical training, which we've, we've touched on a, a few times so far in, in this discussion. Um, Sanjay, could you could you tell us kind of how do you you encourage your trainees to use video? Um, and how has it kind of changed the way that, that they approach um, learning how to operate? So, um, as I kind of alluded to, there's the onboarding process, which is also part of rehearsal. Um, there is obviously the, not just learning the steps, but watching the movements of someone who has carried out these procedures hundreds of times compared to themselves. Uh, there is uh, the ability to debrief. Uh, that picture on the slide is actually myself and Jasmine, uh, who's one of my fellows, uh, looking at the procedure at the end of a case uh, to understand you know, what could have been done better. Um, there is also the ability for peer-to-peer -peer comparison, so trainees can uh, look at their uh, videos with their colleagues and say, you know, this is you know what you think similarly with other trainers and not just the one in the or so there's a whole host of comparators that it allows uh, and it also allows a portfolio to be built and we have an e-portfolio e in the uk that's taken into consideration at the end of your training 
But I think a system like this will almost allow for um, uh, almost, uh, like a reel to be produced, a bit like a reel that, uh, you know, actors and uh, other performers may have when they go for uh, um, uh, a new job or a new role or an audition. You know, we should have a reel for our trainees at the end of their training of all of the lap coles they've done, all the hernias they've done. And it also shows you how their movements have changed at the beginning of their placement with us and the end of their placement with us. And that gives you some objective feedback that you are able to give your trainees, uh, which they really have appreciated. That's great. I mean, so, so you, you mentioned almost like creating a, a greatest hits um, real um, for trainees to add to their portfolio. How about how about the other way around? How do you use video to, I guess, look at, you know, mistakes or things that could have been done better? Like, is is that something that's that's incorporated into your practice? Yeah. So that's part of the debriefing, as I call it. But also, if there are technically challenging cases, all the trainees and you know our colleagues across the unit, we know, you know, to specifically kind of highlight these and 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 use these for education. Uh, the best example is probably laparoscopic cholecystectomy. It's either a very straightforward operation that, and, you know, can, you know, half an hour, you know, in or, in or out. But, you know, the more and more acute lap coles you do, you know, there are uh, challenges that uh, junior surgeons uh, can, you know, uh, fall into easy pitfalls with obscured anatomy, distorted anatomy. Uh, you know, it is an area where, you will you can have a major complication and those are the kind of uh, tips and tricks and uh, visual uh, images that we can share with each other not just in a unit but actually you know across the surgical uh, community to make surgery safer uh, by sharing those slightly unusual situations that you may find yourself in you know perhaps uh, you know an, a bit of instrumentation may help you know we've had some challenging lap coles through covid everyone will tell you that acute lap coles have got much worse you know there are some anatomical variants with the acute uh, um, uh, pathology that has led to a slightly uh, a higher use of uh, one instrument in our unit the endo mini retract that allows you to get round tubular structures with uh, 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 um, blunt dissection for example so these little tips and tricks are really helpful and actually I think there's a huge bias in not publishing and talking about problems and complications. And I agree with you, we need to get away with that. We need to share the complications so that they're avoided and we learn from mistakes, not just of our own, but everyone's. And let, let's pick up on that point a little bit further. So, you know, I, I know that when I was training, um, I, I didn't see my, my consultants, my, my bosses, um, kind of getting together and discussing surgical techniques very often. Um, but you've mentioned that, you know, now that your colleagues re record all of their surgical video, there, there is more collaboration. Um, can, we, can we touch a little, little bit on that as to how, how that's done and, and how that's, in, you know, affected practice? Well, from a collaborative perspective, to be able to do this, you have to think about standardizing your procedures. If you've got, as we have, five or six surgeons uh, carrying out bariatric procedures. And if everyone uses different techniques, different kit, it just gives heterogeneity within the operating room. And that is what can cause uh, potential problems. Uh, it also has cost efficiencies. If you all use the same kit, uh, it tends to be cheaper. You can package it in a different way, but also from a training perspective, if you have the same steps, it's a lot easier for a fellow to come to the department. And if they're working with five surgeons, they actually have five times the volume of the same operation if it's done in the same way. Uh, and so it's collaborative because it forces standardization. And I think for elective surgery, that's you know particularly something like benign upper GI surgery. I think that is the way forward. If you do something well and you do it over and over again, it's easier to train, not just for the trainee, it's easier to train for the scrub tech it's easier to train for the runner and actually our anesthetists prefer it as well because we all operate in the same way that's fantastic um richard let's, let's move on to the next slide please um sanjay you you, you mentioned patients 
um, a, a couple of times um, as we were talking. Um, personally, I, I don't know many surgeons uh, apart from yourself who, who actively uses video when when talking um, to their patients. But I, I'd love to hear kind of how how this has changed the way you you interact and, and communicate with your patient group. So patients get lots of information um, through the provider's website, through the internet. But when it comes to counseling patients, it's quite useful to have your own surgeries to be able to tell them what you're talking about. It's all well and good explaining an operation and showing some diagrams to patients, but patients quite rightly have become more educated and wanna know a bit more about your particular technique. For example, uh, some patients even want to know what kit we use and why. Uh, and it's very helpful to have uh, the access to the videos, you know, quickly. And so although we talk through things and now we're virtually consenting patients, so they get there on a platform where we send them the consent form virtually uh, while before we do the consultation, both in the NHS and in private practice here. So it, it is very useful to be able to also talk them through video. And after the surgery as well, psychologically, it's very helpful, I've found, to show them either images or bits of the video. And if it's their operation, even better to say, this is what your liver looked like at the time of the sleeve. Uh, this is how big the stomach was. This is what we've removed. This is what was left. You know, we, we, we had no complications. This is what the operative field looked like at the end of the, the procedure. And we think that you're gonna do really well. And now we've done our, our bit over to you to do the hard work. So that's an, uh, an amazing amount of transparency, I guess, that you're, you're having with your patients. Um, and then you, you also mentioned that you're using video to potentially explain when things haven't gone to plan to patients as well. So I'd love to hear a little more about, about that experience. Sure, so, you know, everyone, any surgeon who has uh, no complications, uh, as my old boss used to say, uh, is either not doing any surgery uh, or is uh, telling porky pies. So it's really important to share complications. And I know that surgeons that will be listening and providers that might be listening in are worried about litigation, et cetera. What I would say to all of those is actually being transparent and talking about things would probably reduce complaints. And we've certainly found that. And I think if you have a complication, if you share it with a patient and you explain it to them, along with, you know, the continued input from senior clinicians, even if you have complications, actually, you, there's less risk of failure to, failure to rescue. The patient gets sorted out. And actually, even though they've had a complication, there doesn't have to be a complaint or litigation to follow. Now, that might be different in different countries, but I feel that the UK is definitely going towards the, the, the direction of North America with regards to litigation. But I think it's very important to consider to be proactive rather than reactive to complications. So if you do have a problem, share it with your patients, share it with the relatives, talk it through with them, explain to them why it happened and what the challenges were, and then make sure that you're present and more present than normal during their recovery. And you will work with the patient and their family to get them better and they will actually become some of your star patients. One of my patients, in fact, the only jejunal perforation that I've had, which occurred three or three and a half weeks after surgery, and the patient needed reoperation, is actually one of our biggest advocates of bariatric surgery uh, in my patient cohort. And I know him and his family better than some of my other patients who've done amazingly well with no complication. So I would just say that you know, transparency, sharing uh, uh, data with patients, I think it's a positive thing. And we should celebrate what goes on in the OR, not hide in it, even if they are errors. That's great. That's great to hear. Um, well, up on the screen here, we, we've got um, on the, on the left hand side, uh, one of our, I guess, privacy measures that we built into the system. Uh, which is our redactor technology. And uh, as you can see, essentially what it does is automatically blur the screen when the laparoscope is taken out of the body um, just to stop accidental pickup of, of faces and so on and so forth. So uh, Jamie Shur, thanks for your question. He's asked, how is procedural video managed and distributed securely and how is access controlled? 
Um, that's absolutely vital, Jamie. And these are steps that are different with regards to regulatory issues, uh, depending on, I guess, geographically where everyone is. We have GDPR guidelines in the UK in based around European law uh, and British law. And so um, I would say to you that it's very important that you get all of your information government governance, uh, ethical approval for this and IT infrastructure discussed uh, with anyone who's interested in doing this. Um, and the digital surgery team are very open and transparent to provide all the uh, necessary documentation so that all procedural videos are managed in a way that is uh, that con conforms with the regulations wherever you are. Um, the distribution, so it is all secured on an encrypted cloud-based server uh, of the highest in encryption for healthcare. Uh, and you can only get access to that if the surgeon or the provider wants you to have access. So for example, I will have access to it on my account and I'm allowed to give access to my account to other trainees and other surgeons. If I want to show anonymous, and all the videos are anonymized because of the redactor system. Um, so if I want to show a bit of a video to somebody to explain what things are about, that has already been uh, cleared from a regulatory perspective by uh, the provider. Uh, and we've consented all of the surgeons and trainees that operate. So any new trainee that comes to the system, uh, comes to the unit, gets consent, is allowed to consent. So far, no one has uh, refused to consent for surgeries that they're carrying out to be shared with, uh, with uh, colleagues, uh, to be used in M&Ms, to be used uh, if in case of complications. And also if the patients request images, uh, then we are happy to share those images with the patient. And initially that did cause uh, some pushback from some of my colleagues, uh, but subsequent to you know, some of the uh, uh, benefits and the fact that so many people, in fact, all of us are now happy to record things has meant a huge change in uh, kind of institutional behavior uh, and allowed real behavioral change within the OR to occur so that uh, you, know, you can go ahead and, and use the videos in the ways that I'm describing. But it is absolutely imperative uh, that you go through all of the necessary regulatory uh, information governance and encryption procedures uh, if you are looking to set up a system like this or similar to this in your hospital. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to step in for, for Andre. My name is Kristen D'Angelo. I, I lead our, our marketing for digital surgery. Um, and so I'd, I'd love if we can now move to the next topic. I think we, we um, have spent, a, you know, got a really good understanding of the patient experience and addressing some of the concerns um, that, that were brought up in the, in the Q&A. Richard, if you could please advance the slide. So we're really interested now in hearing more um, about your experience in how this technology can also improve OR efficiency. So can you talk a little bit about uh, the features that, that you've used and some of the standardization that, that you've described, Dr. Pukriyasa, on, on really the ways in which um, you've been able to achieve standardization and improved workflow in your operating room? Uh, and, and also explain some of the, the different snapshots that we have here on the page and how those have assisted in that. Thanks, Kristen, and uh, thanks for stepping in. Um, so a lot of the efficiency, I think, comes from standardization. So that's a decision of, of the unit, uh, you know, whether we were going to use video data capture or not. But having standardization does allow uh, a better use of this technology, in my opinion, particularly uh, with the integration of the potential of machine learning. So, you know, uh, there are all the bariatric procedures I carry out with collaboration with digital surgery now is recognizable to a machine learning system. So it knows all the steps uh, and it knows when I, you know, when we're not going to, when we're not carrying out the next step. So if there is a difficult case and we're not carrying that out, 
there is a, a, an option to have that. Um, but from an efficiency perspective, it collects all the timestamps in, in real time. Uh, you can see there on that third image on that, um, on that uh, smartphone, there are little uh, lines above the bar charts. Those are the average times of each step compared to the times that you're carrying out of that step. And you'll be able to see that literally at the end of the procedure. That allows you to be able to feed back to your trainee or to yourself. You know, this was a pretty straightforward case. This was an average case or was there a problem? Those timestamps are collectible, not just for an individual, but for the whole team. So technically they are com comparable. And that is something that we have looked at. And as I alluded to earlier, there haven't been, you know, because of the way that we work, we all work pretty similarly and our outcomes and our times are the same. It's also allowed us to understand which by looking at the video and actually analyzing it, you know, are we using which kit are we using? Uh, you know, what should be within our cardex and what shouldn't it's helped you know take things in and take things out of our kit and sets so it's not just helped the surgeon but it's helped the uh, the administrative and the scrub team as well for efficiency that's great to hear um, and thank you for those examples um, you know, before we head into the, the Q&A, where we'd really like to hear more from, from all of you, um, we'd like to do one more, one more poll. So you'll see that uh, now flash up on your, on your screen here. Um, and we'd like to ask a question of, you know, as we've gone through these three different areas um, for opportunities of how surgical video can improve um, practice and, and um, achieve excellence in the operating room, what's your take? Where do you see the best opportunity uh, for for that improvement. Wonderful. Well, it's it's great to see uh, just you know where there's such strong uh, use and and opportunity to improve surgical training, um, and certainly in the other areas that that we've talked about as well. And certainly um, as as you've shared, uh, Dr. Prakayasa, on on just the ways in which you've seen this with your trainees and in your practice, um, it's certainly been able to supply some some great examples of of how that can be made possible with technology like this. Um, so, so at this point, uh, now we'll move to the question and answer. So Richard, if you could please ad advance the slide. Um, and so with that, um, we're going to put back up the instructions just to remind everyone about how to submit those questions, which I believe are on the subsequent slide here. Okay, great. And so we will, we'll get started. Um, let's see. We've had some great activity. So thank you so much for, for the questions that have, have come in. Um, can you describe, Dr. Pergiasa, how long did it take uh, this technology to get approved at your facility? Can you describe a little bit more about what that process was like for you? Uh, who was involved? What kind of questions were asked? And, and what kind of conversations did you, did you have along the way? I think that's uh, whoever asked that fantastic question, because uh, that, is, that was the most painful part of this process for us. But one of the reasons it was the most painful is when we started doing this, you know, this product really wasn't out there and we were, uh, we wanted to carry out research to see whether, you know, this sort of technology and process would be uh, useful. So there wasn't really any uh, prior system or example to go with. And the second thing that was painful for us is, you know, this is part of the NHS as well as an academic institution. So that meant we had two different governance systems to, to go through. And one is the largest healthcare provider in the world who has lots of issues with information governance and had an issue with being hacked in 2019. So I would say that those conversations were challenging. We had to plan. And although we've been using this system for over a year, uh, all of this actually started in 2017, which is four years ago now. It took about six to eight months to get all the discussions carried out with information governance, with the information technology team, the internal review boards, um, and with the uh, institution executives on one side, which was the NHS Trust. And then we had to go through ethics and all of the paperwork for the university because this was an academic enterprise at the time. Um, and that did take a very long time to get the parties together. Um, but it did eventually happen. It had to get signed off by the academic leads and the divisional leads. 
at the trust and the university. And once uh, we were able to convene that meeting, uh, we were kind of good to go. Um, I think things would be very different now uh, that we have gone ahead with this. I know that there are other trusts in the UK that do use this uh, technology that have had a much easier route to doing that because they've spoken to us and uh, when their relevant colleagues in their IT and information government governance departments contact ours and and kind of have a chat at you know on a kind of professional level it makes things a lot easier so wherever you are in the world uh, I'm not sure if your administrative issues will be as painful as ours I hope they're not but to avoid those you should plan well in advance and I would say a minimum of four to six months uh, uh, of conversations will need to take place unless you work somewhere very forward thinking. Great. No, thank you. Uh, I think that, you know, it can be a really difficult process to get started and, and requires championing like, like you described and, and, and so does everything um, that's, that's worth doing and is disruptive. So, so thanks for, thanks for, for adding that. Yeah, so we've had one question come in, um, you know, that we've, we've talked a lot about about training. Wonder if we could give an example about how this technology has helped in um, an example for, for patient safety. Um, and I know, I know, Dr. Brigiasa, you, you've, you've had some great experiences here. So, so maybe we can hear from you on, on, um, an, on an example of, of how you've encountered that and, and how you've used the, the technology. Um, sure, there's a, there's a couple of cases, but one case in particular, um, which we've um, we've actually uploaded and is available on the uh, Touch Surgery platform as a learning tool. It's called the Needle in a Haystack case. Um, we had a, um, a gas, a, an uneventful gastric bypass in a BMI of about 60 something, where um, right towards the end of the procedure, where one of the final sutures was being put in, the um, needle broke off the suture and disappeared into uh, the background somewhere. And uh, despite looking, it was very, it was impossible to find with x-ray, uh, laparoscopy. And at the time, uh, this happened uh, probably about two, two, two years ago, there were no protocols for what we should do. So ringing our um, head of patient safety uh, we got three different answers. One was keep the patient asleep, send them to CT scan and then retrieve the needle. Uh, one was do a laparotomy and have a good look and take it out. And the other one was just leave it in because it's not harming the patient and we'll find it later. None of these three felt comfortable to me as the attending surgeon. Uh, and actually at the time of these discussions, which had added already 45 minutes to the case, um, my trainee actually suggested why don't we just rewind the video and watch it in super slow motion which we did we actually found that the needle had popped off by catching the laparoscopic port which was in the right upper quadrant bouncing off the diaphragm and falling down between the spleen and the kidney and was actually uh, in retrospect we took it out laparoscopically but we had to mobilize the splenic flexor and take this needle out there was no harm to the patient there was an addition of an hour and a half to this procedure, which normally takes less than an hour and a half in our unit. So it was double the procedure time. We have a duty of candor um, criteria in the NHS, which is to explain all complications in lay terms to the patient. So this was explained to them. We actually showed them the video and said, this is what happened. Uh, they were nothing but grateful and thankful that they did not have to go and have a CT scan or have a laparotomy. And actually as of as with 80% of our gastric bypasses in our unit, the patient went home the day, the day later. So even the extra 90 minutes of anesthetic time didn't make a difference to their outcome. Uh, and we've obviously followed them up and they've done really well. But this was discussed in our morbidity and mortality meeting and it has now led to a policy of how to deal with these things. And because we record everything, we're able to play these things back. So if you do have an interoperative complication, you can, play things back and see what the problem is, not just with a broken needle, but with where did the bleeding come from? What was the structure that was damaged? Or if you can't find a swab, you can actually play things back to see when that swab was put in, the laparoscopic uh, tonsil swabs that we use to see when to take it out. So it's really helpful to be able to, in real time, retrospectively, uh, have a look back at the case that you're in if you come across a problem uh, intraoperatively. 
That's great and, and very, very powerful example. So thank you. Um, in this next question, uh, Andre, perhaps we could direct this to you. Um, we've had a question come in around, mm. um, you know, how do you handle these huge data files? Um, what is what is kind of the processing experience like? And um, what what's kind of the, the workflow? Is someone kind of turning this on and off and so forth? Um, and then I'll kind of, I'll combine that with another question because we've had a lot of great activity um, on the Q&A, um, but, but in the processing of that video, can you talk a little bit more about how patient information is, is protected as well? Absolutely. So, I mean, yes, you, you, the, the, the question is absolutely right. You know, surgical video files can be massive. You know, they can be gigabytes at a time. Um, and, you know, we are lucky that we live in the era of um, fast internet, broadband speeds and cloud computing, right? So. Uh, we're able to manage all of this up on on our cloud servers. Uh, you know, openly we we use Amazon Web Services um, to run that, um, and that gives us the ability to securely store these and process these um, really as quickly as possible. Um, and as you know, we we've mentioned previously, literally minutes after the case is finished, um, you can have access to to that video right there on your mobile device. Um, so the the use case the, or the user experience we feel um, is is significantly changed um, through through the use of our system. Um, in regards to you know I, I sort of also saw, saw, saw some questions about kind of um, rights to the video um, and so on once it's on on our servers. Um, you know again just to be clear you know we act as a data processor we are not a data data owner. Um, so the, the data, the original video remains the property of the hospital or surgeon or whoever uploaded it um, in, in, in case that's uh, of a concern. Go on to a, another question I, I can see here about the, the sort of different specialties um, that the system has, has been used for. Um, uh, you know, obviously we're, we're focusing this right now on the general surgery space or more specifically the, the laparoscopic general surgery space. Uh, but the question here is about other specialties like orthopedics, uh, neurosurgery and cardiac surgery. Um, the answer really is, you know, wherever you are using video uh, or a video camera specifically as part of your operative workflow, um, then, then you can use this system, right? So, you know, for ortho, I would guess that would be um, arthroscopy, um, you know, neurosurgery with, with mic microscopes, you know, cardiac surgery potentially with robots. Um, you know, anything that uses a, a camera uh, for minimally invasive type operations um, can can use our system today. Um, uh, all we require really is a is a video a video output um, to to connect with our system and up to the cloud. Um, so so yeah, hopefully hopefully that answers uh, that one. Um, so um, like we mentioned. Um, our system is designed with kind of data security and privacy from the ground up. Um, once we have the right um, agreement in place with a hospital, uh, we are, our systems are certified to hold that sort of data as long as we have permission uh, from the hospital. Um, if there is concern about spread of that um, um, PII, uh, we can actually enable the system to completely remove all PII um, and completely divorce the, the video from the actual patient case as well. Um, so, you know, we're able to adapt our installation uh, depending upon really the, the appetite of, of the hospital and exactly kind of what they, what they require. Um, let's pick Great. another question here. <clears throat> yep. Yeah, here's, here's one um, that came in. Uh, as we excitedly await the Medtronic robot, can you explain how the touch surgery platform will work with the robot? Absolutely. Um, you know, working working with the robotic team here at Medtronic was one of the, the big reasons why we decided to join um, last year. Um, the, the, the touch surgery enterprise system will be available with every Hugo um, robot system um, as it goes on sale um, around the world. Um, and, you know, I, I think I can openly say that we are an integral part of the roadmap uh, when it comes to the digital tools that will be enabled as, as part of the robotic platform. 
Um, so today that starts with, you know, video management, smart video management, cloud-based systems and so on and so forth. And then as we get into the future, um, you know, really we're, we're, we're talking about using um, AI um, in the future to actually um, help introduce further safety features of the robot and so on and so forth. So, so it's, it's going to be pretty closely integrated with it. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and so I wish we had more time to, to address more of these, these questions, but thank you everyone really for, for your engagement during, during our webinar. Um, I'll hand it over to Andre to wrap things up and Richard, if you could please ad uh, advance the slide. Great, well, um, as Kristen said, um, we're, at, we're at the top of the hour. Um, thank you so much for your time um, and engagement and some, some great questions. Um, apologies, I dropped for a few minutes, um, but uh, thank you, Kristen, for, for picking up the slack for me. Um, like I mentioned, um, this is the first of three webinars that we will be doing, um, so keep your eyes peeled for, for the next ones, which should come out in the next few weeks or so. Um, and yeah, see you next time. Take care, everyone. Oh, I should also say thank you to Sanjay. <laughs> thanks, Sanjay. Really appreciate the time. Thank you, Andre. Thanks, thanks Kristen. And thanks, everyone, for joining.